Hi everyone, and welcome to our first virtual winemaker interview uh, and adventure. We typically would be in a wine region with the winemaker one-on-one, -on -one, but COVID has made us all pivot, including ourselves. And uh, so we're very excited though that our first virtual wine tasting and interview will be with an incredibly special winery. And that winery is Nicola J in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. Uh, Nicola J is the collaboration between Jay Boberg, a record executive, and uh, Jean Nicolas Mayo of Mayo Camazé fame. Mayo Camazé is one of the top domains in Burgundy. Uh, they have no less than six Grand Cru vineyards and ten Premier Cru vineyards and produce some of the world's greatest Pinot Noir and Chardonnay based wines. Uh, the two uh, met during university and uh, formed a friendship that lasted throughout the years. In 2013, they formed their winery, Nicolas J, and uh, are producing some of Oregon's best Chardonnay and best Pinot Noir. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. I see that Jean Nicolas has a glass in front of him. And what we're going to do right now is, if you'll excuse me one second, I'm going to pour a glass of your Chardonnay. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be pouring Mayo Camusé, but I am going to pour some Nicola J. Yeah, the Nicola J is all right. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good substitute. Excellent. <laughs> all right, let me let me take my glass of Chardonnay. First of all. Cheers. Yes, cheers. Nice to meet you both. Indeed, and and yes. thank you for giving us a reason to drink at 11 in the yeah. morning. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So just Is that the Affinite, I believe? Yes, 2018. Yes. Yes, Great. Affinite, oh. yes. Mm -hmm. Very minimal. Okay. Wow. What's in, been interesting for us is we fell in love with Oregon for the Pinot Noirs, and we've been going for several years. But in our most recent trip would have been just before COVID, it's the Chardonnays that have really gotten our attention, um, and and for this reason, I mean, they're they're just we're finding more and more Oregon Chardonnays that just are really really impressing us. Uh, uh, yeah, and and wow, this among them, um, mm -hmm. minerality is always a, a component of of wine, of white wine in particular, that I really enjoy, and I get a glass full of minerals here. Uh, very intense. This is delicious. And this vineyard is. Affinity, it's a blend actually of um, some wine coming from our vineyard at uh, Bishop Creek, where I've uh, also made a uh, single vineyard, uh, uh, Bishop Creek Chardonnay, and a blend of um, other uh, location in the in the valley. And we've called it Affinity because, you know, it's a blend that goes well together. And uh, we wanted to uh, convey that into uh, into the name. It's uh, it's it's true. Chardonnay is uh, kind of the new hot um, uh, grape variety in, in Oregon. What I really appreciate, uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, very good wines uh, in, in Oregon. Um, and what I really appreciate is that it's, uh, it really um, takes its uh, inspiration from Burgundy. There is a, a, a very um, clear trend of uh, winemakers uh, making Chardonnay wanting it to be really right, uh, not uh, not overripe, not syrupy uh, and 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 precise and 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 very and very clear. Uh, this is a clear uh, influence from uh, from Burgundy. Sometimes I think that this tendency is a little bit too uh, stringent and too uh, too really focused on on, uh, on not being overripe, and sometimes the wines lack, uh, where uh, are a bit severe for for my uh, for my palate. You know, Jean Nicolet, it's just so great to hear you say that. What you have said is something I've observed as well too, and this reaction um, towards leaner wines, and and I loved your description, severe. I think that the current trend, trying to bring things back to balance, might be losing a little bit of intensity, might be losing, you know, this pursuit of um, elegance might really be turning into leanness, uh, 
um, or <laughs> at worst, underripeness. I think what you talk about is um, the balance, and that's something that we talk about a lot. There have been tendencies historically for people going for, uh, you know, sort of these bigger, bigger wines and wines that have that fruit. And I still, to this day, especially more with the Pinots than with the Chardonnay, and we've only been out with the Chardonnay now for one year or a little less than a year. But I still would run into people say, you know, I just love those wines where you get that explosion of fruit in your mouth when you when you first put it in and so forth. And I, I'm always very careful to not uh, uh, uh degrade that in any way because that's what they like and that's what they that they want it's just not the style of wine that we're trying to make we're, we're trying to make wines that have that tension um you know that preciseness of of that mix between structure and acidity and fruit and concentration and and those wines also i at least in my experience have been the wines that tend to age well um that you can and that will actually go through various different incarnations and development which make it such an exciting journey. And uh, when you look at our our sort of whatever, I don't know, our moniker, our kind of slogan of Vienna Vec New is, uh, you know, come with us. And that's exactly the journey that we're talking about is come with us on this journey with these wines as they evolve. Because they, they do change, but the starting point is super important. If you're dealing with a flabby, high alcohol, wine that has a fruit bomb of fruit, that's a tough one to take a 15 year journey with. Yeah. And I and I think that this 18 vintage is going to be really great for that because it has a capacity to age both in uh, in, uh, in, in in Pinot and, um, and Chardonnay, but it has a natural balance with a lot of acidity. It seems that we have a site uh, on which uh, uh, our wines are based that really evolve and mature slowly. Chardonnay is, 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 it can be a little uh, really fickle, unreliable, and uh, the next thing you know, uh, overnight, it can go uh, uh, on, uh, overripe. I'm very pleased that uh, we seem to have a, a place that grows Chardonnay very, uh, that is suitable for Chardonnay and that uh, it doesn't uh, ripen overnight. If I wasn't so deeply involved with uh, uh, with Wahinri and therefore a bit worried, I would I would be very amused and and very interested in seeing how this vintage is received by the public. The wines are are, are, are very are, are very nice. Uh, the wines have a lot of fruit, a lot of uh, uh, very uh, nice and fresh uh, aromatics. They're, uh, uh, um, they're a bit tense, uh, but they have, uh, uh, they're very pretty, pretty. They have some acidity. So how will they be received? You know, Oregon is not necessarily known for its acidity. It's normal to find a lot of acidity in, uh, in Burgundy. Oregon is a, is a region that can grow, uh, is, is a cool, um, uh, cool climate region, and it can grow um, uh, vintages which are very different from one another and um, we're not aiming at consistency. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, again, this is a region that, and especially with Pinot Noir, I mean, you, you have to be able to express what nature gives you. And of course, it's confusing in way, in many ways for the consumer because it's it's it, you know one year for, uh, is is very different from the from the previous one, but this is what it, it is exciting too, and yes. so I I hope that uh, uh, this vintage will be uh, received as such uh, by our uh, customers. That's that's a really good point. I would I would ask you guys because in the last several years, and I don't know if it's my personal bias or not, but when I first got into wine. I would pick a wine that I liked and I wanted it to be to taste what I expected it to taste like. And as I've gotten into wine over the past couple of decades, it's been, I want to taste what the vintage was and that difference. And I would suggest from our friends and the people, and maybe we're just hanging around with more wine, you know, enophiles. We are. Um, but I would suggest that that North American palate in particular is maturing and learning this and is much more open. And is that just... Uh, my own bias, or are you seeing that as well? 
I I would say yes. Um, I think that uh, as as people, wine is becoming something that I think people are getting more interested in and learning about rather than just being a beverage. So there's there's a lot more interest in visiting wineries in in understanding how the wines are made. Um, especially with the millennials and and so forth, there seems to be this real understanding and things like organic farming, which of course we 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 uh, 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 is how we farm or biodynamically is very important. How the the wines are made, uh, this whole artisan kind of uh, non-interventionist wine, which would is a very good way of describing Jean Nicolas' winemaking uh, process. Is, is become more and more important to some, some people. But uh, I just think there's just more interest in people learning about it. And when you learn more about it, therefore things like vintage variation start coming into the, into, into the frame where if all you're thinking about is it's just beverage, it's just Coca-Cola, then, then it doesn't, you know, your interest in understanding what's behind it and vary, it's like, well, wait a minute, uh, Coke shouldn't taste different from bottle to bottle. I mean, yeah. it should taste the same. You know, and there are, I mean, without getting too particular about it, there are certainly wineries out there and very successful ones, especially in the Cabernet world um, in Napa that are in steakhouses all around the world that that audience really expects them to taste a certain way. A lot of what I hear jean Nicola trying to do and, and when he's talking to Tracy and myself, what we're aiming for both in farming and whatever is to reflect the vintage, but reflect it in a very transparent manner so that it's not, the wines are not manipulated. They're, they're, they're truly reflecting and, and in much the same way that you would grow any crop, whether it's tomatoes, you know, tomatoes, the clearest thing that m most anybody knows the difference between a tomato that tastes like a tomato and a tomato that looks like a tomato. It has the texture of a tomato, but it really doesn't taste like a tomato. And so I think that everything that goes into that mentality of, of having the purity of flavor is what we're, we're striving for in the wines that, that we're making. The answer, of course, is always in the glass. Nothing is shouting above the other. The acidity isn't, you know, saying, hey, look at me. The texture isn't saying, hey, look at me. The fruit isn't saying, hey, look at me. They're all sort of singing with the same voice, which to me is the balance and lovely harmony. And wow, delicious, delicious wine. So tell us if you could, maybe we could just... Um, hear a little bit more about, um, if we could just pivot back to the history a little bit, just quickly. We know that the two of you met in university. Maybe you could just take us on a, a short um, uh, journey from, you know, can we come with you? Can we, you know, to use your tagline, can we come with you since that day in university, uh, how you guys met, and then, um, you know, to the genesis of the idea uh, to create Nicola J. No, it feels, uh, you know, it's it's going to feel good to go back to when we were young. And uh, uh, so, uh, yes, I was um, I was studying in um, in Pennsylvania at Penn uh, in Philadelphia. And um, the reason I was at Penn is um, actually I, 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 I knew that by then that I would take over the domain. But um, I didn't know it when I started my, uh, my studies. Uh, and um, I studied in a business school in France. And then there was a, an exchange program with, uh, with, uh, with Penn that was set up. So I, I took advantage of it. And uh, I wasn't sure about being a winemaker. You know, the, the family domain was, 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 very, uh, was very much sleeping. And my father had said, well, you know, we need a young uh, person to uh, take care of the demand. If you don't like it, you don't have to stay. Uh, so uh, finish your studies. That will be your insurance policy if it, if it, if it doesn't uh, suit you. So there I was in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. Um, having a very good time, working very hard. I mean, it was, it was, it, it was not a joke that day. And, uh, uh, but having a good time in, uh, at that uh, U.S. campus. And I met um, uh, Jay's uh, sister, Jill, was in my class. 
And Jay was already in the professional uh, world. He's much older than I am, uh, by the way. Uh, of course, it sees, it shows, it shows. But uh, I have, I'm stating the obvious. But uh, it's um, so he was already in the professional world, and um, and he was visiting his sister, and uh, we met at uh, at a party Jill was giving. Uh, uh, for our uh, uh, fellow students, and uh, and Jay was there. So uh, Jay was already in, uh, in very much into wine, so got very interested by my story. He said, <clears throat> "Well, you know, we you should uh, keep in touch when uh, you take over." And this was how it happened. We 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 stayed in touch. I was visiting him when I came to LA. Uh, when I was doing business trips, uh, Jay came. Uh, uh, more than a few times uh, to Burgundy to enjoy wine, and we stayed in touch. And then maybe I, I, I you can talk about it, Jay, how you became involved with uh, with Oregon wine and gave me a call in uh, 2012. Yes, um, that that is pretty much how it happened, and uh, what what he describes. <laughs> it's very funny, all except the much older part. <laughs> He, uh, yeah, that's when I had started, uh, I was in the music business then, and I had started IRS Records. And so we, I was there actually with a band in Philadelphia. And the way it all started was I had invited Jill to come out and see the band. And she said, I can't, I got a bunch of people coming over, but why don't you come over and have dinner and hang out a little bit before you go back to the show. And that's when I got to meet uh, jean Nicola. And yes, it's also true that I did enjoy being his plus one at various different wine dinners in Los Angeles and San Francisco and even New York, um, uh, where it was a great deal of fun for me to be able to go along. Um, I had I was aware of his domain through a gentleman in Berkeley named Kermit Lynch, actually, had told me about, about uh, they did not at that time distribute you, I don't believe. It was Martins that that did. But Kermit, I believe, is the one that told me about Mayo Camazé wines and about Henri Jaillet, who was making the wines for the on behalf of the family uh, at that time. So I was aware of the domain, um, but I think it was a pretty genuine friendship that went on for many years, and we didn't see each other that often. Jean Nicola didn't really like the music that I was signing to the the the, the, the my label and, and to when I was at MCA Universal as well. I mean, sometimes he, did. he liked some of it, but he wasn't my taste in his taste for music or not. Although we do have some things that we like that are the same, especially uh, uh, some of the older stuff. But at any rate... Um, what do you think about the Dead Kennedys? <laughs> What? <laughs> Sorry, carry on, Jay. I can assure you, nor has he heard that song. I never <laughs> played the holiday in Cambodia. Um, Jello Biafra was the leader of the Dead Kennedys. And you're not alone in the look on your face, Jean Nicola, because when we went to release that record, Jerry Moss, who was the M of AM Records, who was our distributor, very mm -hmm. uh, esteemed um, gentleman and a mentor of mine, he steadfastly refused. He had this look of horror and said, I will not distribute that record. And so we had to use a different distribution platform to release the Dead Kennedys records into the marketplace in 1983. Anyways, we digress. So Oregon, um, I had been a fan of some Oregon wines, but like many, um, I, had, I think the first bottle of Oregon wine I bought was in 83. And, and I would buy different things. I had been there once, but I had I was I, I don't want to say that I was an expert on Oregon wines. But what I did notice was the extreme swings in quality and swings in, um, frankly, winemaking uh, prowess, I suppose, is, is, would be the best way to do it and to describe it. And so you could have certain bottles that showed this immense potential that were just really magical bottles. And then you had other uh, years and even from the same winery sometimes where, where there was really like, oh boy, this, this shouldn't really even be on the shelf. I mean, this is rough. Um, and, and, and so the potential was always sort of sitting there. And 
I had, uh, when I, my music career, I was, I was the chairman at this point in 2011 of a, of a digital distribution company. I was no longer out in clubs till two in the morning signing bands or any of that kind of nonsense. Um, and I was, I was really passionate about doing something in kind of my next chapter, if you will, that I shared the same level of passion for that I did for music. And I really considered myself to be extremely fortunate that I managed to turn a passion into a career that I managed to make enough money to, to, to live. Um, and to try to do that in wine was something that was really attractive to me. And Oregon came up because a friend of Jean Nicolas, uh, Veronique Duran, who's also had become a friend of mine, um, she had a general manager named David Millman who worked for me in the music industry, believe it or not. He was, this is just how convoluted this whole thing is. He was head of publicity for IRS records for a number of years. And I actually was part of getting him into wine back in, 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 in those days. He was part of this wine group that I had in Los Angeles. It was really David uh, and Veronique who suggested that that Oregon was the place, and it kind of ticked all the boxes. It, it first of all, it had the potential to make world class Pinot Noir. It, they were making there were examples of world. I'm not saying it had the potential. They were making examples of world world class Pinot Noir, um, and I wanted to make Pinot Noir. It. It was also something where the economics of it were actually feasible, not easy, but feasible. What I mean by that is that you could actually buy land, you could launch a winery, and you could at least come up with a path for that being a legitimate business, one that would actually make more money than it cost. Where most all, and people will pretty much tell you this, I'm sure, most all wineries started in the last 10 years, 15 years in California, um, have a really hard time finding a path towards profitability for all the reasons that we know. There's some rare exceptions, but but for the most part. And um, Jean Nicola, uh, being a friend and I think trust and having somebody that you can kind of be in a foxhole with and not really have to think about it from that standpoint, it, especially as you get older, gains increased value. The idea of having someone like Jean Nicola, who was extraordinary in his field, was a friend and, and not an asshole, despite what some people <laughs> say, but it's true, he's not. Okay. That's a great compliment, thank you. <laughs> Especially after he said how, how much older you were than him. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I knew I'd have a moment to get him back on this. But um, no, it really was, uh, it, it's really worked out fantastic. And I'm, I think the best thing I can say, uh, sitting here you know, nearly 10 years later, nine years later, I guess I worked for a year trying to put this together before Jean Nicola got on board, but, um, is that we're better friends today than we were beforehand. I have to think now with COVID and you not being able to travel, like how has that been for you with being a winemaker halfway around the world? No, it's it's uh, it's a bit tough. Um, I was able to come um, in October, so that was, uh, you know, that was, uh, uh, that was great because I was uh, really, uh, not happy at the prospect of uh, not being there for harvest and for the wines and for the bottling of the 19s and so on. So that turned out well. Um, and um, yes, we work with uh, with samples sent over and uh, and uh, it works. Uh, it works quite well. And it's um, more than two trips a year, usually much to his chagrin sometimes when he gets off the plane when he arrives, but um, usually it's at least four. I don't think you've ever, I mean, COVID is the only period of time that you've made less than four. And in some years it's yeah. actually six or seven. So yeah. he, he, I have someone who tra traveled transatlantically a lot in the music industry. I have real empathy because it's a bitch. I mean, that flight is really long. And I used to do LA, London and LA, Paris all the time. I usually go to Europe once a year or maybe sometimes twice, but usually we go, we do England, we'll do tastings and stuff in England, or I usually come to try to get to Burgundy at least once a year. We are now on to um, your Willamette Valley Red, your Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, pardon me, yeah. from the 17 vintage. And Fantastic. this oh, is delightful. 
Yeah. Oh that's that's thank you thank you thanks a lot so 17 is a vintage that was also a little bit overcast relatively cool uh so very good balance very pretty vintage certainly not the you know the most uh, concentrated and thick um vintage but really the uh type of vintage uh, uh Pinot Noir aficionados really love because it shows the delicacy, the refinement of, uh, of, of the grape uh, variety relatively early on. And, you know, since it's bottling, it's been drinking really well, really accessible, very enjoyable. Uh, you don't have to necessarily say to the consumer, well, yeah, you need 10 years to appreciate this. Uh, it was the most approachable vintage we've ever made out of the gate. 17, the wine that you're drinking now, it's like it came right out of the womb, like ready to drink. It's like on the bottling line, you're like pouring it going, okay, great. This is fantastic. We, let's grab a pizza. Let's go for it. <laughs> um, I mean, you're sort of ready to go. And that was that's actually been fairly unusual for us. Our wines usually need some time to, to settle down. I don't know of any other part of gastronomy where food or wine or, or any other form of beverage where you do get that change as you're eating or drinking. Um, you know, generally you, you eat your meal over a course of time that nothing really changes, but wine over the course of an hour that you might drink, wines like this evolve, they change. And I notice it in the five minutes that we've had it there. And to me, I just find that fascinating. I mean, that that's the hook. Even yeah. tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yes. Are, yeah, no, well, yeah, this thing's got life. That's for we sure. We have a problem in our house. They don't usually make it that long <laughs> to the next mm -hmm. morning. <laughs> Someone gave us a bottle stopper once. We had no idea what it was. This is the Willamette Valley. We know that you're sourcing from several different vineyards in the Willamette Valley. Um, so I'm assuming that this would be a blend. Uh, we really want to, to do a blend that shows uh, the spirit of uh, uh, of the valley of Oregon. We have uh, three or four or five, perhaps, uh, uh, other vineyards from the various areas uh, and AVAs of uh, uh, the Willamette Valley. Everything is done and and vinified as if it were going to end up as a single vineyard, and then you we use them uh, uh, in the blend. So the idea is, is that this is the penultimate expression of Willamette Valley. It's the best vineyards with a very, very fine winemaker blending them slightly differently each year to try to create this, this, this sort of penultimate expression of the valley. This wine, this Willamette Valley, Spectacular. that can sit on the table with any of the wines that we have had, including Vega Cecilia, and you know most of the Grand Cru and Tete de Cuvée champagnes, etc. I mean, this is a this is a beautiful wine. This has got it all. This is what we we look for in a wine. We, we look for a wine that's certainly got complexity at this very young age. I mean, this is only four years past the vintage, right? Um, well, not even. It's three years past the vintage plus a couple of months. Um, and you know, it, it's already it's complex. We like yes to pick. Um on the early side and uh, to to have uh, a good representatives of uh, the, the 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 late uh, the late ripening sites yes okay. well, well certainly i mean if you are picking early there's no um i mean th there are <laughs> phenolic ripeness which is what everybody is looking for i mean clearly this has got full ripeness what's interesting is you'll find certain vineyards because as you guys have spent a bunch of time in Oregon, you're aware that you have a vineyard where, you know, this this acre is for Nicolas J, and then this acre is for a different vineyard, and this acre is for, I mean, for a different winery, and then a different winery, and then a different winery. And you'll have, you know, 10, 15 different wineries sourcing fruit from the same vineyard. And what's really amazing to me is how you can have as long as three or four week differential between when the various people choose to pick from the same vineyard. Yeah. Um, and that's just all about winemaking, right? Those are all just some of the myriad of choices that you have to make. And I think that sort of ties into this kind of handcrafted artisanal sort of concept because 
when you until I've been doing this every year with Jean Nicola, I, I was not aware of just how many dozens of decisions you make that all have an impact on the result mm -hmm. and are all judgment calls. I mean, some of them are technical calls. I mean, something are involved, you know, winemaking expertise and so forth. But a lot of it is you using your instinct, John Nicola, about, yeah, I kind of feel like we need to do this now. Or, uh, you know, we need to, the temperature, we need to raise the temperature in the tank, whatever it might be. It's, it's that mix. And every one of those decisions makes a big difference. So we have just poured um, this wine here, your 2017 Nisa Vineyard. Yes. But maybe, can you talk to us a bit about Nisa and then maybe segue into Own Rouge as well? Yes, uh, so Nisa was one of the great discoveries of, um, of uh, my winemaking experience in, um, in Oregon. And um, really one of the reasons uh, I, I really insisted that we do also and we bottle part of it separately to, uh, to enjoy. Because Nisa is so mesmerizing, so charming to me. It has a, 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 a fruit and a texture and it's so soft. Um, and I've come to learn that uh, uh, this is really what the Dundee Hills are about, um, the earthiness, as you uh, called it also, uh, but the softness, the approachability, the, 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 the really the, the prettiness of, uh, of, uh, of these wines. It's a, an old vineyard by Oregon standards um, because it's, um, this, is, this comes from the core of uh, the Nisa vineyard planted in the 90s, early 90s. It's, it's the charm and the fact that it's so smooth, elegant, long at the same time. And it's a, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a character of Pinot that is uh, absolutely, absolutely charming. And, uh, and the delicacy, it's quintessential Pinot in terms of delicacy, finesse, and, and, and charm. And this is really something that, uh, uh, really a wine that, uh, that we love and that I crave for, uh, actually. So it's um, one of the great discoveries and one of the great surprises of, uh, of, uh, of, of being in Oregon. I mean, to me, this is like, this is like dragging a silk scarf over a satin sheet. I mean, this is smooth. <laughs> I mean, I was blown away by this, the 17 Willamette Valley, but this is just a step up and it is just extraordinary. Grabbing me. Absolutely yeah. extraordinary. Well, that valley con contains, I think in that vintage, at least 10%, maybe even as much as 11 or 12% of Nisa is in the Willamette Valley. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned own rooted and yes, this is um, what is, uh, really fascinating fascinating for a European winemaker is to uh, find some uh, vineyards which are still planted on their own roots because um, back in uh, 65 when Oregon started um, there were there were no vineyards and no phylloxera and um, vintners uh, thought uh, they could get away with it and it's not only until the uh, late 80s, beginning of the 90s, that yes, uh, some of the first uh, vineyards uh, were struck with uh, phylloxera. And of course, uh, it was much uh, wiser and prudent to plant with, um, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with roots uh, and, um, uh, and to graft over uh, these uh, over these uh, American uh, roots as we do in in Europe, but we still have, of course, in Europe. Since we don't have these vineyards uh, anymore, um, we have this. Uh, it's almost like a fantasy. Uh, what if? Uh, so being able to do it in Oregon, to still do it in Oregon, is fascinating. And and yes, we should uh, we should produce this wine um, while it's still possible. Bishop Creek is okay. Nisa is going, unfortunately, uh, and uh, we also Island. have Island in uh, in the blend that is uh, still healthy after uh, more than forty years. So yes, it's um, year after year we um, we were able to craft this wine, which. Um, which has a lot of finesse. 
so tell us more, tell our, uh, our readers and our listeners and our viewers a bit more about old vines um, and, you know, crop levels and, and uh, sort of the why you seek older vineyards. They're harder to grow, they're more expensive, but tell us more about why you pursue them. This is something that uh, we have in mind in Burgundy. We have very old vineyards, and sometimes we uh, we wonder uh, and uh, we cherish them, and but sometimes we wonder whether really this is really worth it. And uh, um, but definitely uh, going to Oregon, you can make good wines, um, very good wines. I think it's a, it's really more difficult to make great wines out of young vineyards. You can make very concentrated wines, um, but that extra layer of complexity of, yes, the wines will be concentrated, but they will have more soul, more character, uh, and, and, and an extra dimension when they get older. And it's uh, again, it's amazing how fast in Oregon the vineyards are taking character and acquiring complexity because after 20 years, you really see the vineyards uh, turning a corner. And um, yes, I've, I've, I'm really looking for that uh, in, in Oregon. I think it's, it's really important. And uh, the future of this wine region is really great because when you can see it, what it can already achieve with relatively young uh, vineyards and what lies ahead, it's it's really extremely pro uh, promising. Tell us about the contrast you see between Burgundy and Oregon. Yes, in Burgundy, by um, tradition, we have a, a very high density of vines per hectare. We have uh, 10,000 vines per hectare. It used to be that before Philoxor, it was even much more. Uh, uh, so when um, when the vineyards were replanted after Phylloxera, they were planted with the lower densities to um, and in uh, and in rows to allow for a certain mechanization. Because when you had um, when you had um, before the Phylloxera, when the, when you did not have any rootstocks. Uh, the um, the renewal of uh, the vineyards were very natural and very straightforward. When uh, you you saw that a vine nearby had died, the next vine you just put a cane part of the cane into the ground, and you know a year after you had roots growing from that part of the cane in in the ground, and you had a new plant. And uh, so that was very, very simple. But of course, over the years, you had plants everywhere. Uh, you had uh, 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 you had an enormous amount and extremely high density, and uh, it was it, it was a little bit chaotic. So when it was replanted, it was at least replanted in rows, so that the horse could go between uh, between the rows. Uh, before that, it was there was not even a horse. There was everything was done absolutely by hand, and uh, so it was an enormous amount of work. But because of that history, I guess we we kept uh, at least ten thousand vines per um, per hectare, and this is becoming to the regulation. Uh, and um, even if it's lower than it, what it used to be in the past, it's still the, one of the highest, if not the highest, density that we're seeing in France. Um, I do think this is also intuitive, uh, but um, one of the advantages of, uh, of, of Oregon not having this regulation, we're seeing a little bit all over the place between low density, extremely low density, something like 1800 vines per hectare, to um, uh, 5,000 vines per, uh, per hectare, uh, like uh, around what we have at Bishop Creek, you do see a difference. So, you know, it's, it's uh, arguably 10,000 vines per hectare, there are some drawbacks. 
we are, we as a team, we are convinced that um, we're seeing that it's it's really much, much more difficult to make great wine with low density uh, vineyards. Just to add into that, I just wanted to say that we're going to plant uh, a few acres this year and uh, and then some more. Jean-Nicolas got some plans for, for some plantings uh, in a few years uh, from France. But I think that we've clearly decided that we're going to be planting at a density similar to Bishop Creek. Um, it's going to be in the 4,500 to 5,000 uh, vines per hectare uh, area, which is is uh, much, much denser than most of the, the vineyards. For sure. Yeah. Can you tell us about the, the new winery? I, I think it's got to be very close to complete in terms of construction. And will there be a tasting room there? And will you host visitors? Yes, uh, it's a 50 acre property. It's on the north side of the Dundee Hills. So it's just over the hill from Druan and Archery Summit and Sokol Blosser and all of those great wineries. And it's a bit cooler than uh, the front side, than the south side of, of the hills. It's, it's, it's by choice um, that we, we did. It's got some lovely sites. There's probably about 25 acres, maybe 22 to 26 acres, depending on how aggressive we want to get there, that are sort of A-level uh, planting sites. Um, we're going to plant both Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. The first planting will be Pinot Noir, but then later this year, we're going to plant a little bit in, in the spring, and then we're going to do another planting in the fall that'll have Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And yes, there's a, a lovely old barn that was on the property. It was a Longhorn, uh, ran, a Longhorn cattle ranch, and we renovated that barn into a winery where we did make the 2020 wines. And uh, also a, 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 a sort of tasting home is the way that I would describe it more oh, than, wow. than a room. It's not a tasting, it's not like a normal tasting experience. We don't have a bar, you don't walk in and, and get your three pours. It's, it's it gonna be, it's really reflective of what we've been doing for our, our guests that visit us for the past few years, which we, we didn't have a winery. We were leasing space, as you know, in at Sokol Blosser in Adelsheim. And so we were doing our tastings at Jean Nicolas in my house. And then we have an old home. And in our dining room, that's where we were doing the tastings. And the idea of this tasting room now that we have a winery is to keep that feel. It's going to be by appointment only as it's always been at our house. But uh, we're really looking forward to hosting folks. And it's a lovely piece of property kind of back in its own bowl. And there'll be places to walk on the property and uh, really looking forward to hosting people there soon. Well, we're, we'll, I'll tell you, we'll be among your first <laughs> yeah. guests if, if, we, if we ever open up the border between Canada and the United States, uh, and which no doubt we will. Both of you have toured the world of fine wine and decided, God, we love this stuff. We're, we're gonna do this. E even though you, Jean-Nicolas, have your own winery, you know, the, one of the greatest states of the world, not just of Burgundy, but of the world. And and you, Jay, have, you know, um, had through very hard work and being a very successful record executive, the opportunity to travel and taste around the world. And yet you have chosen to make this wine so that you have something wonderful to drink. And I think it's really important that our viewers understand that. This will be very difficult wine to find. You guys will produce in 2020, how many cases? 2020 is a bad example because of the okay, fire. So, but so uh, 2018, 19, we're probably looking between Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and uh, 35, 3,000 to 3,500 cases range. Okay. So, I mean, it's very small production. And most of the wines that we've talked about today are 100 cases or 150 cases or 200 cases. Um, okay. The Willamette Valley is usually more than 50% of our, our production. The intention is that you will, you know, you'll, you'll make wine and you'll keep a certain amount of inventory at the winery, at the tasting room, so that yep. when visitors come, that, that's at least one way that they can acquire the wines? Yes, of by, course. We have a we have a, a, a wine club that we call the Conferie, uh, keeping the tradition of uh, organizations who cherish particular things. 
Um, so we have that, we have the, the visits to the winery, and then we have lots of great partners in restaurants and independent wine shops. We're big fans of uh, independent wine shops and that are sort of curated by men and women who share the same level of passion for wine that, that, that we do. The people watching this are, are no doubt going to be excited and are, are going to want to acquire the wines. That's for sure. So people from all over could email uh, to info at Nicolas and say, do you have a, or one, do you ship to my locale? Um, they could buy direct from you. Or two, do you have a retailer in my locale? And you could give them a bit of guidance? Absolutely. We'd be more than happy. I can pretty much guarantee that after this call, we're going to go and clean out BC. <laughs> right. well, you have been incredibly gracious, both of you, with your time. Mm -hmm. we, we are going to follow up with in-person visits, if you can stand it. I think I can speak on behalf of Chris. These are okay. spectacular. Yeah. yeah. Nice yeah. Thank you both very, very much. Um, I'm looking forward to this being the beginning of a friendship. Absolutely. And with the hope of meeting and um, clinking glasses oh, together. We yes. look forward to that. And enjoy those wines over the whole weekend. Those will be good tomorrow. I mean, those will be really interesting to taste tomorrow too. Yeah. I totally agree. Totally agree. We will. And um, well, what I'm gonna knock out, if you knock back all three bottles, then so be it. But I mean, you know, I just, I would imagine you'll, some of it will make till tomorrow. You guys Great. have a weekend. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate you your interest. Thank you both Thank very you so much. much. Okay, bye-bye.